Hello all. Um, this is the 10th uh, webinar of the series of webinars from 2020-2021 from the Social Solidarity Economy and the Commons Conference. Uh, today is December 13th and it's uh, 1.30 Portuguese time to 30 p.m. Central European time. We have uh, three special guests today for our webinar, Andy Stirling, Robert Hall, and Anna Margarida Esteves. Andy and Robert are speakers, while Anna will be our uh, commentator. Um, the title of this webinar is called, it's named uh, Opportunities and Barriers for Community-Led Initiatives in interaction, Interacting with International Policy Institutions in the European Context. Uh, this webinar was organized by Roman Hausman and myself, Andre Girardi, and uh, it is uh, uh, the sponsors or the institutions that help uh, the webinar as well as the conference to happen are FCT, Foundation for Science and Technology from Portugal, SEI ISCTE, the Center of International Studies from University Institute of Lisbon, the University of Institute of Lisbon itself, uh, Associação Mutualista Montepio, uh, also the Center for Ecology, Evolution and Environmental Changes. Uh, another one is, another important one is Sciences from University of Lisboa, Sciences U Lisboa, ECOLIS, the European Network for Community that initiatives on climate change and sustainability and university, Federal University of Alagoas, UFAO. Um, to quickly introduce our speakers, first is Andy Stirling. He is a professor at University of uh, Sussex, uh, professor of uh, science and technology policy at a science Policy Research Unit at the University of Sussex. He's also co-director of STEP Center, uh, which is a center that works on issues of power, uncertainty, and diversity in science and technology. He has served, he has also served on a number of uh, uh, UK and EU, EU governmental advisory committees. And I could go on as we talked before, but uh, it's a big list and a big background. And it's a pleasure to have Andy with us today. Uh, we also have uh, Robert Hall, a very special guest who is originally from California, but he is uh, currently in Sweden, he, which he has migrated to in the 80s during his studies in international relations and economics. Uh, further on, he got a master's on environmental engineering and sustainable, sustainable infrastructure. He has worked for the Swedish government. He also works now uh, as an elected member of the regional parliament in Gotland, on Gotland. Uh, he has worked uh, for the United Nations, the European Committee, the organization, also the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, uh, in subjects mainly in international development cooperation, internationalization of education, and in strengthening democratic institutions. The list goes on, but it's also important to say that he is, uh, he, he lives and he's one of the, the founders of Sudabun Permaculture Eco Village. Uh, he also joined the Eco, uh, Global Eco, sorry, the Global Eco Village uh, Network in Europe as a managing director and has served uh, in the international board. And he's also member, foundation member of uh, ECOLIS, the European Network for Community-Led Initiatives on Climate Change and Sustainability, which he has also served as a president. Uh, and third uh, is Anna Margarida Esteves, also a pleasure to have her with us. She's a research fellow at the Center for International Studies in the University University Institute of Lisbon. He's, she's also a guest assistant professor of the Department of Political Economy in the same institution. She holds a PhD at Brown University uh, in the United States. She is the principal investigator of Euroregen, 
uh, which is uh, which stands for Transnational Networks for Regenerative Development in Europe, uh, which is also a comparative perspective on grassroots mobilization and policy advocacy. She's a, a great friend and my PhD advisor uh, as well. So uh, just a quick overview of how this webinar is gonna work. We are, uh, this is the 10th and the last webinar of this year, of the series of webinars. And uh, first we're gonna have uh, the, uh, Robert Hall speaking for about 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, and second, after that, we're gonna have Andy speaking for 15 to 20 minutes. They, they are free to move around with less than that if they need to. Uh, then Anna is gonna have, uh, is gonna make a brief comments where the, both Andy and Robert will uh, talk about, and then we open for uh, for comments and questions from the audience. You're always free to, you're always welcome to write down your questions, your comments, and so on the chat box. And I will be uh, the one reading and posting the the comments or the questions to the audience. And if we have a lot of time, maybe we even open up the mic. So you're free to, to make your questions in the end as well, okay? And in the last uh, five minutes or so, we have a closing and wrap up, All right? So now I pass the word, pass the mic to Robert Hall and welcome all. And Robert, the floor is yours. Okay, Th thank you very much, Andre. It's a pleasure to be here. Pleasure to, to be able to speak on this topic. I see myself very much as a practitioner um, who's been working with this for more than 10 years. You hear me fine? Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, opportunities and barriers for the community-led community -led initiatives. Um, I would say I'm speaking, um, and Andre wrote, read up a little bit of my background, but I've been involved with eco villages. I've been involved with permaculture. I've been involved with transition movement. Actually, I came into this with the bicycle movement, um, which is also a, a community-led movement, um, and un understood their structures of local bicycle clubs, national bicycle organizations, and then a European federation. Is it just me or he stopped? Yeah, same for me. Uh, okay, so maybe we have to wait a little bit until he comes back. Same for me as well. Okay. Uh, that's quite interesting because his internet was good so far. So. Yep, thank you. Um, as I was saying that I've been involved through these different, the three, the, the traditional, movements that belong to, we call the Ecolis umbrella, permaculture transition and eco villages, but also I had some experiences seeing how the cyclist movement in Europe has actually been able to build up an organization from local associations at the community level to national organizations, and then a European federation that was very effective in influencing European institutions, including the European parliament. Um, so I took that inspiration to work primarily with the, the Echo Village movement. Um, and then I would like to just say, well, community-led initiatives themselves, they're very, of course, place-based, physical, local. Um, they may have a possibility of influencing at the local level. Um, and some of them are engaged uh, in influencing at the local level. Uh, that can be a challenge because they're actually working with change and innovation. Um, and that's not always welcomed. Uh, at the local level, it's hard to be uh, recognized at the local level when you yourselves coming with completely new uh, and different ideas. Um, that's why we think very much that um, networking is key, um, making it sort of a trans 
trans-global, trans-local approach of working together through networking, networking local initiatives together at the national, European and international level. Um, and we've also seen our, our need to not only network within um, a certain type of community-led initiative, but we've also seen a need to do network weaving, where we're actually weaving together our network with other networks. And that's sort of, Ecolis is a good example of that, of uh, where the networks of transition, permaculture, and uh, eco villages were actually able to cooperate together to try to do policy influencing together. Um, and that was specifically catered for influencing at the European level. Um, I've also been very much involved with the Global Eco Village Network, which has uh, focused more on influencing at the global level with the UN system, especially with the COP, um, because climate change is very much connected to what the Eco Village movement is trying to um, push. Um, another world is possible. And actually, the, the history of the Eco Village movement is very much connected to its initial attempts to influence uh, the UN Habitat meetings in the late 90s, where it was also quite successful coming with this sort of fresh new ideas. Um, we have to understand, though, that uh, all these community-led initiatives, per definition, their networks and networks of networks are going to be quite chaotic, uh, meaning there's never going to really be enough uh, resources to have where um, where one top down structure is going to be able to dictate what type of uh, policy messages we want to come across with um, to gather the resources to to mobilize everyone. It, it's it's a dance between what the local initiatives feel as a priority, what the national networks of local initiatives feel are priorities, and um, European umbrellas or international umbrellas. So we have this, this dance of trying to be, make ourselves articulate at the same time as we are really based on local initiatives that are very far often from these international fora that we're talking about. Um, uh, we're, we're today working very much in Europe, uh, trying to interest the community-led initiatives to work with the EU program called Community-Led Local Development. Uh, it seems like one, uh, one program that was very well designed for working with community-led initiatives. So that's why that one is particularly interesting. And it is very important to remember implementing for example, EU programs, to implement projects of EU programs, that is a very serious way of engaging in policy influencing, because policy is not only the political policy, those political policies need to be implemented through programs, those programs fund projects, and if one can get a project funded, we are influencing, because that influences the reporting back on how the policy has been introduced. Uh, it it uh, also affects how policies are adjusted. So we have been very successful, I would say, with, with uh, accessing U EU funding in, a, in a, a ro and many different programs. And that is actually a major way of influencing policy um, through its implementation. Um, otherwise, we can see that community-led initiatives are often limited in their resources, uh, and resources can be financial resources, but it al also can be time or uh, capacities, skill sets. That's why there's always been a reliance on also co collaborating with researchers. Researchers are able to um, clearly formulate some of the ideas coming from community-led initiatives that are difficult to express um, from one particular community-led initiative. We don't have the helicopter perspective that the researchers have. And the researchers are also able to help us get some data, some concrete data, in order to be able to see the big picture. And that's one of the points that I come back to is that 
data collection um, by community-led initiatives or rather their networks um, become very important um, if we want to do policy influencing uh, policymakers are very sensitive about facts and data and that's why we really would need to um, focus more on collecting data to be able to explain um, how much impact we are making how big we are um, all of our connections we find that a lot of community-led initiatives are layers that f f that lay on other layers so that we have a lot of really interesting dynamic effects of multiple different types of community-led initiatives interacting with each other in the same locality in localities in uh, nearby or even very far away so that's really hard to capture and it's hard for people within the community-led initiatives to actually see that and that's what we need our own data or we need data coming from from yeah, uh, organize public structures or from researchers. Um, the because of the limitations of financial resources to community-led initiatives and their networks, um, we're mostly forced to either use social media, which for the most part is free, virtual um, media, um, which is very difficult as we go up the hierarchy. At the local level, um, lo community-led initiatives can make news and thus become newsworthy and are able to get free uh, media coverage at the local level. But as we go up in the scale, uh, media comes becomes more and more inaccessible. So if, if you come up to, for example, a national level or a European level, media is quite inaccessible um, for the community-led movement. We don't we're not able to um, penetrate through these corporate uh, levels of becoming newsworthy at a continental space level or, or national level. Um, we're coming with a, a, a different narrative, a competing narrative, and it's not always welcome. Um, we have, however, been very successful. And I think Ecolis is, um, really the, the, well, the example of when networks woven together were able to create something that could directly influence policy making uh, rather than policy implementation, um, where Ecolis has been invo invited to directly influence the formulation of the EU rural vision, for example, um, and other policy, in, uh, policy instruments that were being developed by the EU. So we had no problem actually accessing policy processes once we were organized, once we realized um, which policy processes were going on and, and getting ourselves invited, um, being seen as a, an actor that actually has something to offer. And I would just mention some of those. I mean, we have the European Green Deal is very much in line with what um, the the movements I've been talking about are trying to uh, accomplish, trying to get a, a major reform of European agriculture uh, through the farm to fork strategy. We have also the EU clean energy package, which really wants to redevelop, uh, to, to change, to decarbonize Europe, uh, where the policymakers have realized it won't be possible to get a 55% emission reduction without involving local communities. And thus they've actually set up um, their renewable energy directive version two to really accommodate renewable energy community, communities and citizen energy communities to get people to change on the ground. So things have been very much in our favor. They continue to increase. We have the, a very large leader community-led local development CLLD program that is an expanding budget. We have a, a smart village program as well that's also coming in that's more community focused than what leader has been focused. Um, so, so things are going our way and for, as far as, as, far as uh, um, programs that would support more action by community led movements. Um, yeah, I will conclude there that we have had um, uh, 
initiatives uh, in the past and uh, even today that have been able to break through themselves and influence policy, mainly at the national level. Um, but otherwise we have to network and it's through broader networks of networks that we can actually make the influence. Um, we need to be agile uh, and try to influence in, in the various areas that reflect what our CL, our community led initiatives are doing. So thank you for that time. And I would be happy to answer any questions later. Thanks Back a lot, you, Robert. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Robert. That's uh, very, very fruitful insights here. I was taking notes, so maybe I can share later on. Um, and thanks a lot. Uh, I'll pass directly to Andy. Andy, Great. the floor is all yours. Great, thank you very much. That was really inspiring. Thanks, Robert. And uh, I think I'm gonna kind of step, I'm an academic, uh, at least in one of my uh, modes. So I'm gonna step back and, and build on what Robert has said to paint a broader picture. I hope it's useful. Um, I'll share my slides again as an academic. I guess it's inevitable I would have slides to show. So let's find them. So, yeah, I don't think I'm going to say anything that's entirely new to this group. I mean, there's a whole load of experience. So I'm really looking forward to the discussion. But I'm going to riff on um, some of the questions that were raised. And I hope that will uh, help the conversation move along. Um, so the title, Community-Led Initiatives and Incumbent Policy Institutions. By that, I mean established, organized structures of local government, of business, markets, academia, the media that we heard already uh, some really uh, important stuff from Robert about. And I'm gonna just raise some questions. I could be wrong in this, but raise some questions about the kinds of activities that sometimes the movement more broadly around community-led initiatives might be in danger sometimes of, of um, becoming unduly pessimistic about what has in fact been achieved and the means by which that has happened. So let me uh, try and uh, substantiate that. Uh, let me just um, put, I can't see my own things there, one second. Yeah. Um, so the question that was put to us, it was a really good question for this session to Robert and I, um, it was about are social movements in danger of marginalization by policy actors? And of course, that's a very important question and it's uh, valid on many levels, but I wanna ask, is it really community-led initiatives and their associated networks that are marginalized in movements towards sustainability transformations? If we take seriously the sheer magnitude of the politics of sustainability, who's marginalizing who? Um, in fact, could you, could you as much say that the key challenge is to achieve the marginalization of these incumbent structures? And maybe if the real challenge is to marginalize the incumbent structures, and we can see examples of that having happened in progressive change of the past, then worrying unduly about me mar marginalized by merely by policy can be undermining. So what do I mean by all that? Well, that, that's, uh, that, that headline went, I got a bit excited and I put an S in the front, but just to state the obvious, let's remind ourselves of the sheer magnitude of the political imperatives that this wonderful array of initiatives that we're talking about here in these networks around community-led uh, organizing actually are, are grappling with. Um, they're you know, obviously addressed in sustainability agendas, challenges of war, of oppression, of injustice, of uh, subversion, of environmental degradation of so many kinds of resource depletion, hunger, global hunger being as major a problem as it currently is, catastrophic global environmental changes like climate disruption, like ozone depletion, water provision, um, radiation, biotechnology, the, the list goes on. And of course, uh, crucial issues of emancipation. These are all rolled up in the sustainable development goals and has been pursued at this high political level, which I think community led initiatives form around for many decades now. And they are very ambitious. They are very challenging. They are not just about policy, they are about politics. And the agenda uh, slogan that's picked up often quite uh, problematically in its, its hypocrisy, but is leave no one behind. This is a very ambitious agenda 
for global politics, even for the most local of politics. And of course, the, the fact that this is challenging means that this radical plurality and ambition gets branded by incumbent institutions, by the media that Robert was talking about, for instance, as the stupid development goals. It really is threatening. It's not a question of simply trying to solicit patronage from these institutions because they are on the opposite side. Um, and it, in much of these institutions, whether they be in big business, in government, local government, global agencies, NGOs, the media, the key discourse around all the kinds of challenges I mentioned, all the kinds of challenges that community-led initiatives are doing so much to address, there is this rhetoric of there being just one way forward, the way forward, uh, which is the most powerful way hegemonically of controlling these debates is to prevent those uh, in the societal interests, even imagining the possibilities of the kinds of changes that local initiatives are pioneering. And crucially, of course, the drivers of this one way forward, whether it be in agriculture, in uh, energy, in housing, in uh, uh, IT, whatever sector it is in, the drivers, as we know, of the innovations that are framing possible futures are private profit, economic growth, and to an extent that really isn't fully recognized, military domination, the biggest area globally of innovation in the world is around projection of mass violence. That's the largest area of expenditure, public expenditure on innovation. So what's important about sustainability then, and the challenges I began with, is that these actual drivers of incumbent policy institutions who we're worried about being marginalized by are actually nowhere in the SDGs. The SDGs are often seen as compromises and uh, ambiguous and uh, problematic in various ways, but they do not contain anywhere in the many metrics and indices anything like that agenda. So I think it's worth reminding ourselves of what different worlds these kinds of activities are in, that actually this imagination of control that's so strongly asserted by these institutions which uh, we're talking about trying to get some sort of traction with are really uh, overbearing. So when, when we face the prospect of the price of influence seen in mere policy terms rather than political terms is embodied in things like metrics, targets, the need to demonstrate impacts, to bid first before you can receive money and depend then in a clientship uh, role because of that, that we are disciplined by deliverables, by roadmaps that only have one roads, the evidence base where there's only one voice coming from the evidence, consensus is the only acceptable form of participation, et cetera, et cetera. I think we're all, many people here, much more familiar than me with these institutionalized modes of closure, all curated and mediated and asserted by these incumbent interests who we're talking about trying to gain influence with in policy terms. And we can see the imprint of that in the way that the favored ways to resist these kinds of challenges of social justice and environmental destruction, the favored ways of doing that are labeled in very different ways to the sustainability agenda addressed by community initiatives. We hear about grand challenges. They're, they're as much grand as they are challenges, important platforms for grandness. There's far fewer of them. It's not so confusingly diverse. We hear about the transition as if sustainability is just one thing and the question is to go to the thing. We hear about the Anthropocene, which is an extremely confused idea of humans controlling an earth when it's manifestly obvious we can't even control ourselves. We hear about the nexus without ever really being discussed clearly what are the things joining in the nexus. Planetary management agendas are getting ever more prominent in ways that lead towards control ambitions like geoengineering. And we hear, of course, a lot about nudge that the main challenge for progressive change is somehow to control the people, control within democracies uh, rather than seeking to control the democracy space itself. So these are the favored forms in which the kinds of changes that we struggle towards are, are cast when they want influence. Make it simple, elevate a pitch, etc. So why I'm banging on about this is because the one thing we know about progressive change is that's not how it occurs. It doesn't occur by cockpits with dashboards being informed by social movements. It occurs by rumbustious, unruly, chaotic often activities of the kinds we're all familiar with, inspiring and embodied in the, so the community initiatives we're talking about of many different kinds, moving not in scaled ways, not as if there's local, meso, regional, 
international scales, the connections are intimate rhizomically between these scales. Scale itself is, a, is an artifact sometimes that makes us think, uh, discipline ourselves to think in particular levels. So let's just try and substantiate all this talk with a little bit of concreteness that if we think about the, the challenges embodied at the beginning in sustainability agendas that I began with, none of them would have been on the agenda had it not been for social movements acting in ways that were not trying to get policy impacts, but were political in a far wider and deeper form around social equality, human well-being, ecological integrity. These are the, the, the basis for what happened in the 1980s when these agendas finally reached the highest levels of global discussion. And it's not just true at that level, it's also true of the problems that constitute sustainability. For instance, take the environmental problems, whether they be pesticides, asbestos, ionizing radiation, heavy metals, carcinogens of many kinds, chlorofluorocarbons, endocrine disrupting chemicals. Again and again, as we look back and we see the progress made by social movements, often crucially em embodied in community initiatives, what we see is a picture of change where these incumbent policy institutions, academia, government, local government, uh, the media, business, were on the other side, resisting to the last, even the imagination of these being problems in the first place. And likewise with the responses, the so-called solutions. When we look at community food, uh, 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 the more ambitious forms of recycling, the open source movement, uh, renewable energy, uh, self-built housing. Again, these were all considered in my lifetime, I'm 60 now, ridiculous ideas when I was in my 20s. Um, but now in various ways they've become mainstreamed, but they haven't been mainstreamed by policy uh, dashboards being informed by evidence-based, uh, for evidence-based decisions primarily, that came later. They were informed by cultural change, by political uh, um, uh, mobilization of the kind, for instance, embodied, if you think about the interesting case of renewable energy, the Danish uh, community initiatives that founded a lot of the um, present intellectual property that's embodied in, for instance, wind turbines of the big multinationals now, Chinese multinationals included, the intellectual property goes back to community initiatives in Denmark, which were just do it, doing it rather than seeking to um, elicit this patronage. So I'll just wind to a halt then in this. Um, if we think about then the qualities of um, mobilization that really helped to achieve this political pressure rather than just policy influence, it's the diversity of the inclusion that what's being grasped, it's impossible to grasp the full breadth of the possibilities and the challenges associated with sustainability that I began with, unless we have diverse inclusion of the kind that community initiatives typically, especially in the networks, represent. But also not just what goes into these initiatives, also what comes out. It's not a single message. It's not a single elevator pitch. It's not a single evidence-based prescription aggregated in the way that experts do. This is pressure for alternatives coming out of the sheer energy and diversity of these movements. So it's not about processing single outputs. It's about gaining cultural recognition and political commitment, not just policy patronage. And so, you know, we see this in, for instance, the difference between citizens juries, which are instruments supposedly inclusive, but are actually engineered for consensus. What community-led initiatives involve, not just in thinking and talking, but in action, is a far more open-ended uh, process. So the, the, the picture I'm trying to paint then is not either or. Of course, other these policy engagements really have their place there, crucial, but not for the reasons supposed, really, that the really important thing is about political traction, not policy influence. And if we're serious about resisting these deep-seated pressures that I began with, moving from this more controlling imagination of these incumbent institutions towards the caring agenda of sustainability, then this metaphor of murmurations, rather than it being a single transition, it's much more culture, political culture seen in the long durée historically, is more like animals flocking, coordinating with each other in horizontal ways rather than hierarchical scaled structures. And so that's, I think, what's been achieved by community initiatives on the kinds of issues I talked about by this kinds of process. So the array of initiatives embodied in these networks, car clubs, repair cafes, eco-housing, agroecology, energy co-ops, credit unions, community forestry, the, the vast diversity of these kinds of initiatives are best seen, I think, as, as 
parts of social movements who achieve the real uh, changes that they promise, not through primarily through policy influence, but through political traction. And so more than then the right danger being of policy incumbents marginalizing community led initiatives, I think transformation is where these social movements that these initiatives are part of actually succeed in marginalizing the policy incumbents. So they have to follow, like on the issues I've talked about. And too much worrying about being marginalized might mean that we're actually we're in the very danger we say, and we should maybe be looking at uh, how to marginalize rather than be marginalized. Anyway, um, I'm, uh, I'm prone sometimes to a colorful language, so I hope that uh, had something in it that might have been an interest. There's definitely something in it, <laughs> Andy. Thanks a lot for the the words and the the slides. Also, they somehow express a lot of your vision in there. Uh, Anna, I pass uh, the the mic to you uh, to make some comments, and then uh, maybe we we'll flip the order, or if you direct the questions, then they can answer in order. But otherwise, we can flip the order for Andy being the first one to comment and then Robert. Anna. I actually I actually have a set of questions for both. Right. One set of questions for Robert and another set of questions for Andy. Thank you both of you for your presentations. They were really thought provoking, really, really rich and interesting. I, first, I would like to ask Andy if he could please email, email us your presentation. It, no is highly re it is highly relevant for the project we are currently developing and it would be really useful. And if you could share with us some, uh, some references of literature on the topics you were talking about, especially, uh, especially that modernist cockpit, um, control room kind of mentality versus the spontaneous, fluid, often chaotic, uh, dynamics of uh, knowledge production in social movements that would be wonderful and really, really useful no, because no it, it helps to explain a lot of things, especially in what regards the, um, the opportunities and barriers for collaboration between scientific institutions and social movements in the promotion of community-led initiatives for climate change and adaptation. And it also helps explain some ba many barriers, but also some opportunities we find in policy making and in policy advocacy. Okay, so I have a set of questions for both. First, it has to do with the very concept of community. Could you please define the borders of what community means in our policy advocacy efforts? What are we really talking about when we talk about community? It's because the word community has been, it is a little bit like the Che Guevara t-shirts. It has been used so often and in so many environments, in so many circumstances, that very often it loses meaning and it, it ends up being, being a kind of empty signifier that it is more of a, an adornment than anything else. To the point that it can even be used to, to purposes which are very far from the goals that were envis initially envisioned. And could you please differentiate this concept of community as framed and as promoted by, by networks of community-led initiatives like GEN, like the Transition Network, like RIPES, the, the Intercontinental Platform for Social and Solidarity Economy, and also by ECOLIS. And could you please differentiate their approaches from that of um, of, uh, from that of mainstream public institutions who very often, who very often uh, uh, identify community or perceive community as local government, which is, which is seen as the, lev as the community level of government, governance. And what distinguishes the kind of policy advocacy we promote from that of municipalist and regionalist movements, including those like the Catalan independence movement, or even the, or even the, the or even the Flemish nationalists, and also, of course, movements like rebel cities, which include Barcelona, Naples, and many other fine cities, which have been promoting some very, um, uh, some very interesting progressive. 
uh, programs for, uh, for local governance. And speaking of Flemish nationalists, I would like to point out that localism is being pursued by far-right traditionalists who also claim to be communitarians, to be all about community building or rediscovering community or rebuilding community and so on. How do we, pre how do, how do we prevent that, that our movements may be associated with the far right in the public sphere? And from your perspective, what characteristics of our networks of community-led initiatives can serve as a kind of vaccine from infiltration by the far right? There have already been attempts, huh? So this is the set of questions for both of you. For Robert, okay, you referred to the to UN habitats in the late 1990s. Could you please elaborate on the differences between in, uh, between international decision making and international negotiations at the UN level and the supranational uh, decision making um, procedures at the European Union level? What different approaches to policy advocacy do these two different types of, inter of, um, of interstate negotiation require? And could you give examples of how networks of community-led initiatives have acted when relating to, uh, to UN institutions and compare them with, with the work that ECOLI's transition network, Jen and Repas have been doing when exercising policy advocacy in the, in, in the European Union institutional field? Uh, Robert, you also, uh, you also emphasized climate change mitigation in your um, in your uh, uh, in your presentation. Climate change mitigation and adaptation is beyond car carbon redu reduction. You said that there that there have been some very um, some very significant progress at, at the level of EU policy making. And you even sounded very optimistic regarding the, uh, the opportunities such developments have, have created. Uh, but still, to what point is LEADER, CLLD, Smart Village and other uh, programs really in favor of community-led uh, uh, community movements? To what extent do, do they really integrate the concept of community that is promoted by these movements, Com community as a system, as, um, as a very complex entity that can only be understood in a holistic manner. And in your opinion, what is the role of Ecolis, of Gen, Ripes, and Transition Network in bringing what you say what, what was the role of these networks in bringing what you, you claim to be favor, favorable conditions for, uh, for community-led initiatives? Which role did these networks play in these recent developments? Okay, let's take a deep breath because I still have a set of questions for Andy. You claim that community-led initiatives are marginalized in climate movements. Could you please elaborate on that? You also referred to a modernistic imagination of control. This is a really, really interesting, um, a really interesting concept that reminds me of the reflections made by Fritjof Capra in the in the, in the early 80s, in his book, The Turning Point. Um, although, uh, con well, The Turning Point was published in the early 80s, nearly 40, nearly 40 years have passed since its publication. I think the book will turn 40 next year. I think it was published in 82, right? So, and since then, uh, the, the incumbent, um, incumbent institution, institutions have claimed to have integrated systems thinking into their functioning and into policy making. I wonder to what extent did that, ha did that happen? 
to what extent did they overcome the Cartesian slash Newtonian approach, which is so characteristic of the imagination of control? Because the modern state is supposed to be all about control. And, and even with all the transformations that it went through during the last 40 years, it is still based on that, that, on that imagination. From your perspective, Andy, what has changed since the publication of The Turning Point in the early 80s? If you read that book, you might remember that it, it included insights on European green politics, especially, uh, especially the environmental dimension of the anti-nuclear movement. And what parallels and what differences do you see between those movements back in the early 80s and contemporary movements like Fridays for Future and Extinction Rebellion? And last but not least, I would like to refer that the European Space Agency and the newly created European Union Space Program are actively promoting research and technology, as well as funding lines aimed at monitoring climate change and supporting climate adaptation. These projects and their funding calls appeal to interinstitutional collaboration and also to a very strong involvement of social movements and, uh, and uh, citizens' organizations. And, and many entities claim, and from my perspective, I think they're quite right, that the data they produce is fundamental for climate monitoring and also for supporting climate adaptation and promoting climate change mitigation. Still, how can you make the control room mentality that underlies ESA and the European Union Space Program palatable to the, to the often chaotic dynamics of, of, knowledge produce, of knowledge production in social movements? How can we integrate both approaches in a way that promotes favorable cultural change? That's it. Looking forward to, to your responses. All right, so Andy, uh, thanks a lot, Anna. That's uh, a lot of yeah. questions and a lot of reflections, yeah. but uh, yeah. perhaps Andy can start. A great talk. Yeah, sure. Well, thank you, Anna. Wow, that's uh, no really great reflections. It would take many uh, sessions in drinking in a pub to uh, to do justice to those. But uh, oh yes, I would love that. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, that's how that's how these things actually happen, actually, uh, rather than uh, than in uh, webinars. But uh, it's great. To, totally. It's a great chance to. To, to, to taste it. And I want to leave time uh, for both Robert, who I'm sure has got more to say than me and, and others on it. So I'll just be very telegraphic and we can pick up anything that might be interesting. So you asked about defining community. Where are the boundaries of this? I think we should worry. We sh This imagination of things having boundaries is part of, it's a colonial imagination that underlies modernity itself. It underlies so much of our thinking, even in self-conscious oppositional forms. Uh, it like scales, you know, the imagination of scale makes us discipline ourselves. The imagination of categories makes us discipline ourselves. Community is not something with a boundary. It's something which you see over there. It's a it's a it's a location. It's a, a lo locus which things can be nearer or further from. It's like sticking a flag in, flag in the landscape, not fencing the landscape of meaning. Stick a flag in it. It doesn't matter exactly which side of the boundary is. Community is in that direction. And um. It's, it's, it's not a category then, it's a, it's a channel for relations. So for me, community is what we call a channel for relations, which may the most senior person in a, in, a, in, a, in a multinational corporation will also be in a certain channels in communities where the relations are horizontal, mutual, equal, caring, hopeful. These are features for me of community, whereas in other, you know, like the German Gemeinschaft, Gesellschaft, it's, it's vertical, stratified, unequal, controlling, fearful is the domain that we're trying to resist. And so often we try and think of those kinds of spurious, I think, regressive values contaminate what we're thinking of as a community. Um, and that then goes to your second point. Sorry, I know I'm not answering you properly, but I'm just sort of throwing it out there about right wing communitarianism. In one sense, of course, the right wing. Ha have communities, are in favor of communities, 
uh, in the sense I've just get that there are everyone has these channels. Community is not preserved for the right thinking left and the right, uh, no, you know, oh, you, we can't call what you have a community. That is a colonial attitude which engenders precisely the, the problem, I think. So for me, then, um, uh, thinking about things in terms of values rather than these categories, you know, that the right wing is about superiority, not equality. It's about asserting in a mono, mono doctrinal way, not pluralism. It's about uh, othering, not solidarity. It's about uh, conservation, not flourishing, you know, th these kinds of things. So let's argue about these values. And we then that we find ourselves distinguished very easily. It's not community itself. If we try and exert a totalitarian claim over community, we are performing our opponents. If we instead say, no, what matters in the community are these kinds of values. Um, the, the questions you pose specifically to me, great, again, um, you talked about uh, me saying that community-led initiatives are being marginalized in climate discourse. I, I'm actually, I, I, I'm not sure how I gave that impression, but it's a good point to make back. I do think actually the present form of climate discourse organized as it is around these elite technocratic institutions like, like IPCC, where, where on earth did environmentalism get the idea that the way you change the world is by reproducing exactly the institutions that they resisted on all the other issues that they won. The idea that there's a control agenda, we can control the world's climate, that there's a, we, we need to model it first. There's a 1.5 increment in global mean temperature. We average over the whole earth and that becomes the means by which we achieve progressive change. It's really almost, it would be funny if it weren't so tragic. So yes, of course, really authentic, social movement activity of the kind that environmentalism has always been driven by is marginalized by that discourse. But that's because it's the wrong discourse. We shouldn't try and join in on that technocratic discourse. We should do what social movements have always done is just bypass it. It's what, that was always how social movements on progressive change were resisted. Um, you mentioned Fritjof Capra, yeah, dear to my heart. I mean, as I mentioned at my age earlier, you know, it's formative time for me, like a duckling coming out of the egg in the 70s. Um, I, uh, Fritjof Capra featured large. Maybe actually though, to what I'm talking about, even more than Fritjof Capra would be Ivan Illich. And again, another fashionable writer from that era. And I think it's worth going back to these sorts of debates, not just in the 70s. I'm a, of course, a European, so exposed to those kinds of debates all around the world repeatedly. It's it, it, the idea that change again is a, some sort of going somewhere from A to B is again a, a restrictive imagination. I think it's more like a kaleidoscope. <laughs> you shake it and it reforms. It's about patterns. Time, you know, in that sense, it's time is not unfolding in this linear way. We're, we're struggling to just reform things that are already here, just reform them, surface some things, push down other things. It's not about replacing one thing with another, which is part of the agenda we're up against. And in that sense, and I think that um, this right wing agenda you talked about, how to avoid being assimilated or co-opted, um, I really worry that I think it's, if you look around the world at authoritarian populism, it's amazing how coordinated globally the nationalist right is. How can it be that nationalist forces should be so coordinated, erupting at the same time within a very few years in completely different political settings? And I think it's because, and it's, a, it's an oversimplification, right-wing authoritarianism is a global reaction to this hegemonic left-wing environmental authoritarianism. When, when we hear experts know the best, do what the evidence says, we see the whole domain of politics turned into a technocratic thing. The, of course, the pandemic has done this more than anything. When that kind of overbearing authoritarian expertise, which presents itself as left, it provokes this reaction. You know, it's, so the way we avoid being assimilated by the right is stop provoking them with our own authoritarianism. Um, and, it's, and that's what underlies my sort of points I, I tried to make earlier about community-led initiatives really. Um, so in that sense then, you know, Fridays for the Future, Extinction Rebellion, you know, I, I really, uh, I, I, I so admire many features of it and they're inspirational in many ways, but I am also terrified by them. The idea that you see people in the streets holding banners saying, do what the science says, really frightens me. The, the idea you've got five years to save the planet, otherwise we should just despair. Absolute despairing, fearful rhetoric. So how did environmentalism come to that, I think? Um, so without criticizing the individuals, I think that is a control agenda on steroids. It's, it's not through our own control agenda, 
that we um, affect change. And so your dilemma about courting the ESA, you know, of course, there are honor the point I try to make, it's not othering people, there are honorable people everywhere in business, in the ESA, form bridges, engage in the ways that Robert was saying really inspiringly, absolutely do that, but don't do it to court impact on their terms. Do it to, to embrace and bypass in ways that environmentalism and progressive social movements have always done with incumbent institutions that deal with people, not in their professional mode, but in their citizen mode. And amazing things can happen there. So don't bow down to what the ESA are trying to say about this control agenda. Um, embrace it and change it by not working within its paradigm, I, I would say. But these are wide issues and I, I, I know the devil is in the detail, but I'll stop there. But do you mean that we shouldn't work with them or sh we should work with them, but in a way that subverts yeah. their paradigm? Yeah. I, I think I haven't had time to articulate today, but work with them is the terms of trade of work. So what I'm interested Sorry? in is it's the terms of trade. What does work okay. mean? So I, the times when I've been luckiest to engage, for instance, with including global multinationals, the nuclear industry who I was working against uh, is, is a kind of it's like features like political judo, like Trojan horses. There are means by which you may do what they think you want, but that wasn't what they wanted. And they only find out later it's not what they wanted. Or you're using these, these institutions are never monolithic. They're even in a multinational, there'd be different departments who are, who are treating each other more as enemies than even the opposition are out in the social movement. So get in there and use the strength of one against another. You know, so this is work and, and deal with everyone, in, you know, play, Play the ball, not the player, like in football. Don't, don't, don't yeah. get angry with people. People are always allies in their mode of people, but the institutions can be enemies and you can undermine those institutions by their own people. Uh -huh. um, these are the kinds of, so yes, work, but ask what work means. Don't just do what the bid says. Don't deliver what the deliverables say, subvert it. And as Robert said, dance with it. Fantastic. I would love to continue this conversation with you, with you also because I would like to, to develop a research project which is exactly about that right. and which involves ESA and the European Union Space Programme, cool. but which is ex exactly about that, about, about those strategies of subversion. Yeah. And I would, I would like to ask, uh, to ask you to kindly send some literature on those. Sure. No problem. Processes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you yeah. so much. Thank you. Robert? Uh, Robert, yes, exactly. We passed Robert. Thank you, Andy. Thanks. Your mic is off, Robert. Sorry, you're muted. Okay, thank you. There you go. Yeah, very, very inspiring both to hear Anna's questioning uh, mind and also to hear Andy's uh, answers to those. Um, yeah, I think there was some really good stuff coming bubbling up here. Uh, where I would say that we have a lot of things shifting at the moment, things are changing really fast. Uh, it was alluded to when we start to get these problems with, um, yeah, I I even in the Echo Village movement right now, we don't speak openly about vaccinations because it's so dividing. Mm -hmm. and, and we've, uh, people uh, in the Echo Village movement that have, uh, associated themselves with quite uh, leftist policies in the past, find themselves at demonstrations with people from the far right, um, trying to, to figure out what, what, what makes sense anymore. So we have a lot of things happening where questioning structures, um, politics also moving. Um, so yes, we have this, uh, the one thing that you, you asked about was the climate change mitigation, uh, the successes, you could say, of Ecolis in trying to influence the European rural long-term rural vision. At the same time, as things start to move really quickly, so that while the Commission is really pushing their European Green Deal, the member states, particularly perhaps um, some member states maybe with a more authoritarian leaning are, are um, starting to question this and saying, no, we do, we do not accept uh, centralized European um, decision-making over the cap and that we demand uh, national decision-making over the cap. So just when it felt like we were able to actually influence 
European policy. It's sort of pulled out from under us that these things have to be sent down for national decision making um, with these national level common agriculture policies, um, sort of losing our ground there. So things are shifting there at the same time as things are also shifting with, you know, this previous maybe linear thinking, it, we just influence European structures to try to have a good tomorrow, where we're realizing that things are getting really obviously difficult. Um, we may have um, uh, natural catastrophes, uh, ecological collapse leading to societal collapse. It's no longer certain that these extremely slow policy reform processes make sense. Um, and so we have divided in our community-led initiatives, does it make sense to try to influence policy or are we past that? And there's some division there in those communities. And you were asking about what is communities? Yes, I, I, I think the richest form of community is those communities that are actually physically living and cooperating and socializing and working together in one physical location. But we can't deny we have also other types of networking and nomadic community and digital community that do exist. This actually are substantial parts of people's lives. So they do exist. We do have examples of communities that are not physical and which make things very complicated. We find also that those physical communities, not everyone in a physical community is engaging in the networks and the network of networks. There are less and less people. And there are people in those physical communities who are questioning what is the point of getting involved in these networks and these networks of networks. So we have, um, it's a grayscale is what I'm trying to say. There's no very little black and white here. There's a lot of grayscale about who is part of what. Um, I will say that uh, you asked also about the communities as opposed to um, communalist or municipalist uh, type ideas. And there, these may actually go together um, if neighborhoods are actively kept, networks of neighborhoods are actually leading up to this more a municipalist type structure. There, those, those are very similar to the ideas of our community led movement of having everything um, uh, locally place based and deciding how much power or uh, consent we want to send upwards and to be very questioning about that and always having a veto on what we can send upwards. So that's where, yes, the municipalist and the community-led initiatives feel very closely uh, coordinated. This infiltration from the far right in the community's movement, um, th that is real, that is becoming more and more real. We talked about it as a theoretical danger for years. It is a real danger today. And the line is getting very, very fuzzy, just as we mentioned before about the vax, anti-vax. Um, it, it is really hard. And we have tried in different uh, bodies of community-led initiatives movement movements to try to clarify what are the values of our community-led movements? Um, what, what do we accept? What type of behave, behavior do we accept? And how to divide, to differentiate between those that are not um, that should not belong to us and those that are. And I've seen now examples. Gen Europe is working on um, new uh, um, conditions for how we can get rid of members that do do not fulfill um, the, our values or do not follow our values. I saw, th saw this happening in, in other organizations. So the Baltic Echo Village Network, the Swiss um, Echo Village Network are also working on these type of, of, of uh, new value statements and procedures to get rid of mem uh, members um, that don't fit, um, that fulfill the values uh, description. And I would like to talk about um, uh, maybe, a, um, the difference between fear-based and love-based or um, 
that hate-based and fear-based uh, ideologies do not really fit in. Um, they're not inclusive, um, and thus they don't fit into our community-led movement, uh, uh, community-led initiative movements. Um, you mentioned also the difference between working with the UN and the EU, um, the international versus the supranational. And yes, there is a huge difference. We are trying to, um, yeah, uh, to insert, to inject good ideas into the UN system, um, trying to get those to spread in the UN system, but that's about it. Uh, it it's a quite different story with the supranational EU which has an ability to collect taxes indirectly through the member states, and thus has a lot of policy that needs to be implemented. And we want to be there to implement that policy. And we believe also, just as was mentioned, a lot of really subversive radical stuff can be done in the policy implementation. And maybe not it was exactly what was originally intended by those policy uh, advocacy, uh, the, the policy, uh, uh, the policies that were established, but it is actually po possible on the ground to, to really make a, a difference and um, uh, realize what we believe is the right type of change. So I think we're seeing a split, uh, a lot of fractionalization between different, um, different ways of acting. And I think that's going, that is natural. And it's something we just have to accept that we work one way when we work influence policy, we work another way when we work hands-on in our communities trying to demonstrate a different way uh, another world is possible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Uh, now we have uh, open mics, so everybody can ask questions if you can if you want to open your mic and ask them nobody wrote in the chat so far because uh, maybe Anna made so many interesting uh, remarks and questions uh, Roman actually has one but I would also before passing to Roman uh, I would like uh, Robert and Andy uh, to know that uh, well this is also my opinion but it would be nice, probably you didn't know each other before, maybe you know each other's work, but if you two have questions or provocations to each other, as you're both speakers, that would be also nice. Then you're not just talking to uh, answering us or presenting to us as other people, but you also interact with yourself. So if you have something that you want to ask each other or, or uh, make an observation on each other's comments or, or speeches, that would be very interesting for all of us as we're here to uh, listen to you above all. Uh, now I pass my uh, pass the mic to Roman. Roman, are you in a good state to talk right now? Or you need one more minute. I will try it now. I hope it's not too noisy uh, from the kids, uh, but uh, yeah, I'll try. Uh, so actually, well, first, thanks for really to all your, your inputs. It's, I think it's super interesting also, especially um, as, as Anna said, we're working currently on a project that really deals with these issues. And I think it's really a lot of nice input for this. Yeah, Maya, this is too gross. Du brauchst ein kleineres. Sorry. And yeah, actually, I have, I have two questions, um, one to, to each of you. Um, so the first one would be to, to Robert. Um, because you have a lot of practical experience in, in dealing with um, policy institutions like, like the EU, uh, European Parliament, and, Europe, and so on. So what I was wondering is what you have said, if I understood you correctly, is that, and that's also my experience, that um, there has been really an increasing interest in, in hearing what community-led initiatives, especially also the networks like Ecolis have to say, and giving these, these uh, social movements more spaces to articulate themselves. Später, bitte. Um, so I was wondering what what is your impression really what, the, what these people like members of the European Parliament, for example, what they really expect or what they hope to get from you if they invite you. Um, so I don't know. In, I mean, in the worst case, it's, it's just something that um, they just think is, is nice to do to make uh, European politics look more participatory and uh, giving citizens more space to articulate themselves. In the best case, it would, of course, be something like like Andy has said, to, to open up and broadening out um, uh, policy discourses and actually having 
really uh, insights from from uh, citizens to actually impact and, and shape how um, policy making and, and regional development uh, is happening and how, how funding streams are organized and so on. So what's what's your impression on this from a practical side of view? That would be really interesting. And then also this links to, to Andy's question, uh, like what you, what you said, and I also share this uh, really um, a lot that often, of course, these um, policy making, especially at the more uh, higher levels, like international levels, später, Leila, yeah, später that this is really highly uh, influenced, of course, um, by, by um, technocrats and also by, by the most powerful actors that, that shape these, these decisions. So um, do you think that for community-led initiatives, it's, it's easier actually to, to target collaboration or engagement with policy institutions at the more local or regional level because they might be more accessible or less rigid in their structures and processes of policy making? Uh, compared to more international or even like uh, United Nations level um, uh, discussions uh, and maybe so use this as kind of a, a way through maybe more local or regional policy institutions that are still part of the formal political system through them also impact uh, uh, policy making at the EU level maybe is this something you you consider as does, does it make sense to you so that would be my question so, yeah, thanks. Okay, thank you for that question. Um, yeah, uh, the European Parliament, of course, it, it, uh, is composed of a number of different political parties. Some political parties are very receptive to what we're saying and others are not receptive. Um, those that are receptive, you know, we're pushing in open doors. They, of course, fully agree with us, etc. cetera. Um, so we don't have, um, that problem that uh, they're not receptive. In fact, I would say that the that members of European Parliament are very happy to hear from civil society um, because they are overwhelmed by corporate lobbyists who would like to meet them and to push their special interests. And they're not equally as uh, inundated with requests coming from civil society, especially their local civil society, et cetera. Um, yeah, maybe for obvious reasons that we, we don't have a resource civil society that is actually capable of, of, of playing on the same playing field as the corporates. So that, that is the major issue. Um, I would say the European Commission is this, this technocratic body um, led by a, a mixed commission of different political backgrounds. I don't think our current commission is super radically left as such. It's, it's very much middle of the road. In some places it's conservative, um, but that commission has been very progressive with this European Green, De uh, Green Deal thinking that is very much in line with what we want to do. Um, and like I say, that, that there is some problems that maybe they themselves don't have full control over the situation, and and but they do they do have um, power over a large budget and the implementation. Um, so that makes it really interesting uh, when they're interested in the change. I think it's in some respects they realize the huge change that is needed, and for some reason the being at the European level, they're liberated enough from the realities on the ground that they're actually able to think um, in, in new ways. And that comes back to your other question about wouldn't it be much easier to work at the local regional level? And I think many of our uh, local initiatives have found it very difficult to work at local levels. Um, even at this program, which I was promoting now called the CLLD, is that you those those structures actually collect local hierarchy local nomenclature that want to prevent change even though these programs are for innovation and change the people that are in the local or regional um, positions of power they do not really want change so this is why um, our movement has felt more comfortable working at European levels than we have at the local level. Um, there is some examples to the contrary that where, but then you have to be quite mainstream 
your ideas have to be quite mainstream. Your change has to be quite mainstream um, to actually be interesting for local politicians who are less comfortable thinking outside the box than um, these European politicians. Um, so that, that's, that's, that's my impression is that we actually seem to be more welcome with innovative thinking at the European level. When you aggregate up all these local initiatives into new innovative thinking at the European level, that looks very attractive. When you look at one specific local initiative, um, they're easily labeled as crazy people doing something that's not fitting into the local culture and structures. So that's why we think we get a lot of resistance at that level. I'll stop here. Yeah, that's a really interesting answer. Um, and to the question you posed of me, Roman, which is related to what Robert just left off on about, about our higher levels of governance structures more closed to this kind of thing. I just want to, in a way, it echoes what Robert just said. I, I think it's, it's necessary to be open eyed about what power is actually. You know, power is not control in just the way actually Robert implicitly, I think Robert, you were saying this also, power is not control. Control is a very familiar experience. It's what happens when we interact with functioning machines. You, you intervene in a very specific way and a very specific thing happens that you intended and nothing else. So one-to-one -one mapping on input and output. And it's an incredibly uh, difficult set of relations to enact control but it does happen in, in, with functioning machines. So that's why the imagination of modernity is so fixated on this wonderful, what previously was an absolutely eccentric anomaly becomes a norm that we imagine then the whole world can be treated like a functioning machine with a one-to-one -one correspondence between input and output. And it, we utterly deluded. So we, we then have senior figures in political systems I don't think they they don't imagine themselves doing this because they know, like Barack Obama's chief of staff, Ram Emanuel said, you know, don't let a crisis go to waste. The most powerful actor in the world cannot control anything. They can just use crises to try and nudge a little bit towards what they want. Likewise, the British prime minister at the height of the British empire, arguably um, said, you know, what scares you most? Events, dear boy, events is not controlling. So that's it, there is no control and so when, the left or when uh, ostensibly uh, challenging movements say, you're not controlling well enough. That is supporting this utter fallacy of control. It's treating it as if the world is controlled. And what that helps is it doesn't, those who are in, in power are not actually controlling, they're surfing privilege to maintain, to maintain their position. So they're not controlling events, they're surfing them, just like a surfer does. And so when they hear stories of control, it helps them surf what they know is not control. Do you see what I'm saying? So when we, if we want to court uh, influence with these characters, we can give them the resources they need to surf by making out that they are controlling. That's what academics all the time do all the time with evidence-based policy. We pretend that the world is controlled and we are an instrument of control and hand it to them. And we're not helping them control the world. We're helping them maintain their privilege. That's like at the medieval court, that's what we're doing. And I think that's what social movements could do when they do that. Civil society organizations, big environmental organizations, that's what they've started doing as a sort of asymmetry that progressive movements are against power. And so over time, they get churned over. A conservative pro-power don't have to do that. It's only something the left faces is this constant need to churn organizations. The right doesn't need to do that. The conservative party in the UK can remain authentic for hundreds of years <laughs> and faithful to its principles, whereas the left has to change. So I think that's a sort of dilemma when you see power in this light. So for me then, these high level institutions are in some ways more closed, but in ways Robert said, some ways more open. They are culturally closed because they're so elite. Most people in these movements, because most people in the world are not elites. So we're bowed by cultural barriers of class and caste and so forth from these. But if we get through, we find culturally they can be open and especially they may really want stories like here's a network that spans your entire political jurisdiction. You can use this as a resource to maintain your privilege. Of course, they'll love it. Um, and the question is, what's the price? So you can then use that in some ways. And at local, conversely, at local government level, sometimes it's never more oppressive, this 
you know, deliverology of of remits and and uh, evaluation is horrible. I, my 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 partner works in has worked all the time in community led initiatives, and you know, it's it's that municipal culture can be far more stifling even than the European Union. So it, it's more complex. It's closed. I think that, that the upper levels are closed culturally because they're difficult to access. But if you're successful, they can be real opportunities. But distributed uh, local government settings can be horrible in, in the culture they've got. But just because they're under the radar, you can get away with things more in the way that Robert also said. So it's, it's, it depends. You have to look at more fine grained detail, I think, to know what you can do with these kinds of opportunities. And again, that disrupts this language of scale, that there's something for the local scale, something for the global scale. For me, it's all a rhizome interconnected intimately between every scale. And what matters is not the scale, it's how you act, what the values are and so forth. I'll stop there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I had a question though. I mean, I mean, I'm sure there's more interesting ones, but I did want to, Andre, you, you said, ask Robert, I, I was just, if something else doesn't come up, Robert, I'd be really interested in what you think about what kinds of changes you've seen in uh, community-led initiatives over the past two decades. If you recognize anything of the, the kind of thing I'm talking about with the environmental movement, this disciplining, this domestication process, has anything like that occurred in your experience in local, the world of local initiatives? I can answer straight away. I mean, the I, I know the Echo Village movement best, and it's also the one we have a longer trajectory. We have, you know, 50 years to go back and see what's happened. And there has definitely been, um, you know, from the, the 70s and 80s, uh, a desire just to leave society. And then there was this slow reproachment where we thought that it would be better to get but closer again to society so that we see echo villages that were built in the not knots in the in the in the tens um, these were actually close to cities they were much more integrated um, and that's why i think we're again coming to a, a point where the, the feeling that um it's not really possible to change things and it's we don't see the changes needed um uh, are, are going to come in time. And so, I mean, a more popularization of collapsology, et cetera, that there once again, just as there was in the 70s and 80s, a desire to actually distance from trying to be integrate with society, influence society to, to again, maybe distance ourselves and uh, um, try to figure out how do we survive in a post-collapse society. Uh, could I make a, a remark on what you've just said, Robert? Uh, okay, I know that I'm repeating what... Uh, I know that I'm once again hitting on a topic that we already talked about. In many of our conversations, I know it's a personal obsession and a pet peeve, but isn't withdrawing from society a kind of privilege? At least this is... At least this is the impression I got, and this is impression is based on experience, especially research that I've already done in, in several Africa villages that in order to be able to withdraw from society into a kind of alternative world or alternative community without risking falling into debt or marginality or other forms of sig significant downward social mobility, you need to already have a really strong safety network in form of personal wealth, or at least, or at least social capital. You need to have your back very well covered in order to be, in order to be able to do that. And you need to have, you need to have a really high level of social capital to at least understand the ideas that are behind, you know, the ideas that frame those alternatives. And you need to have a very solid self-confidence and sense of self in order to be able to detach from mainstream ideas of success, in order to be able to let go and to live without mainstream signifiers of uh, status and success. So I wonder to what extent isn't, it, isn't this, ability, this, this possibility 
to, to withdraw from society only accessible to those who are already privileged within, within, within the system that we want to leave, be it by, by means of personal wealth, of social capital, or even certain, certain kind of intersectional positioning, which derives from, from a person's gender, perceived race or ethnicity, education, level of education, and so on. If you look at the biography of, of biographies of founders of eco villages and of long term members, it's very rare to find to, to find people who do not enjoy this kind of privilege. Thank you. Yeah, I, I would agree with you. The, the high level of social capital to make this possible. Um, I don't think so much other privilege may be necessary. I think that you shouldn't underestimate the disenchantment of today's youth. And I don't know how much of that would be connected to privilege, but there is a lot of lack of interest in uh, the trappings of, of the mainstream materialistic culture. People are just, or young people are just questioning, I don't wanna do that. I'm not interested yeah. in that, or I don't see the future in that and being interested in something else. And I, I don't know that they have, oh, I, I mean, that study has needs to be done to see if, if that is uh, connected to class or, or educational level. I'm not sure it is. I think it's, it's, it's spreading quite rapidly that mm -hmm. uh, young people don't see that today's establishment, today's elite, are offering reasonable responses. It's becoming more and more apparent when you see things are falling apart. There's more and more um, in, environmental catastrophes. And then the answer from the establishment is either continuing the, the, the same or actually tightening down and, 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 uh, and, and going further away from the change that would be needed. So I think young people are really seeing through that and saying that they have to, they have to dare to try something else. And maybe they're not addicted to affluencia yet, uh, if this happens at a quite young age. It's very true. Uh, it's very true. We have we have Greta, we have Aruna de Weber, we have many young people like them, but we also have many young people who just excuse my bad language, just suck it up and become resignated or who escape into a virtual world, something that might be even more facilitated by the metaverse or who, or who just drift into far right politics. Uh, and I think, and at least from my perspective, the best way to, to make sure that we'll have more Gretas and more Aruna de, Ve de Vevers will be to, to promote policy advocacy in a way that will lead to the creation of funding mechanisms that ensure a universal basic income for the people who want to dedicate their lives to, to, these, to these kind of projects so that they can do it without fear and so that they can resist their, their, their family's pressure for them to work for the man and to fall into, and to fall in, into the trappings that so many idealistic youth and so, and so many young people who are disillusioned with the, with the system end up falling into because they don't see any other option. And to be transparent, for me to become an academic was a compromise that I made in order, to, in order to be able at least to partially escape the system, in order to be able to afford the time and the intellectual freedom to do the kind of, of work we are doing today. Otherwise, I would have no other choice than to take a corporate job or to become a civil servant and to end up re reproducing the very same system that I criticized and still criticize. Unfortunately, in most cases, that kind of youthful rebellion just turns into re resignation. Resignation, you know, consumption of Prozac, consumption of alcohol and other drugs, consumption of some on, also online escape, escapism. There are many ways of, yeah. of uh, there, are many, there, are, there are many strategies for being able to cope with the dr drudgery of everyday existence. Yeah. 
right-wing populism and so on. So we need, we need mechanisms that make it viable for them to, to, uh, to search an alternative and that they can use to show their family and those who, and, and friends who mean well, who want them to do in life that yes, there are other ways of doing well in life. That, that helping to create alternative projects doesn't mean condemning ourselves to condemning ourselves to poverty, that social marginalization or social opprobrium. That's it. But we need adequate policies, adequate policy programs. We need adequate funding mechanisms. Uh, I don't think that trusting that young people are rebellious enough will be enough. The 60s already offered as a very good lesson. Many people who were young and rebellious in the 60s became the yuppies of the, of the 1980s and the Trump voters of the last decade. Um, guys, I am the one who has to bring the time. <laughs> we actually passed five minutes from the initial time. Maybe some of you have to go, so I respect that. I know we, we could go on for hours here, uh, but I will <clears throat> make a last provocation and then pass the word to you guys uh, to say thank you and so on. Uh, I thank Andy, uh, Robert, and Anna for joining and for the very insightful things. And my provocation is if you had uh, Harry Potter's uh, magic uh, stick to change, let's say, one thing or to move one thing around and so on. Let's limit that power. Let's not go crazy and change everything. But if you have that stick for, uh, let's say, uh, one morning and you, you could wake up and use as a to use as a magic, what would you change in your field of of activity or uh, of expertise and action? What would you change? in terms of that uh, use of a magic. And you can say your last remarks and maybe be very brief on that provocation if you can. If you also don't think about anything, uh, you think about a lot of things you can also say, but uh, thank you so on for, thank you so much for uh, participating on this. You're all very welcome to join the next webinars and also the, the conference that hopefully uh, depends on what the world, world brings for us next year. Hopefully we are uh, together in Lisbon and you're also welcome to join us there. Robert has been there with us before and it has been a pl pleasure to have him there. Andy, maybe next time you also join us, uh, okay. you might get an invitation uh, for it. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I passed the word. Maybe you can just uh, find your path or your order there i'm not going to point to who has to be the first one uh, well i can uh, i can thanks um i would love to join in these discussions are really not only fun but enjoy uh, but uh, important i think um yeah so much to say i i would say in re re answer to the question one thing to change it's a slightly academic one but i'd say if you take seriously that the driving formations behind what we're dealing with are very big and deep historically. Coloniality, modernity are shaping even the imaginations of the critics. Then what, I, I'm very suspicious of young people, old people type of discussion, women, racial, you know, it's, there, there are huge issues around these, but I think, I mean, and, and Greta for me is as much a manufacturer, I mean, she's an extraordinary person and there's huge value in what's being done by her and around her, but she is manufactured in the same way that, that so much of popular culture is increasingly, I think. And so for me, the one thing would be, let's stop talking about categorized identities and start talking more about relational values. And if we do that, it's not a panacea, but a lot of things start disappearing as, as, as conundrums and threats. Yeah, um, if I had uh, Andre's the wand of uh, Harry Potter, I would really love for everyone to get a chance to feel their animal roots um, as part of nature. I think everyone needs to feel that, and that would be really a help in getting some perspective 
on things in this very, very artificial world. Um, and thank you very much for this. And should I pass it on or someone else will spontaneously? Roman, look like you're having a quiet moment there. Um, yeah, uh, I, did, I don't know. <laughs> I didn't think of anything to say uh, about this. Um, yeah, I have to think about this, it, it first. <laughs> Maybe Anna, you May go first. <laughs> you mean me? Yeah, my, 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 my provocation was for Andy, Robert and Anna actually, but it's nice that Robert <laughs> best to stick to Roma. Maybe he, he wants a little bit okay. of quiet. Oh, <laughs> but Anna, go ahead. Uh, you, you can uh, finish it uh, with your oh, yeah. uh, final Sorry, remarks. I thought, they were, oh, I, I thought they were, you were passing on and Marnie, Hermione's hand uh, mm -hmm. went to me. Yeah, could be. Whew, I would change, change so many things. I don't know where to begin, to be honest. I would change people's perception of what a successful life is. It's very nice. Very interesting. Uh, so actually, thank you all for, for joining us. Uh, this uh, session has been recorded, will be on our, in our YouTube uh, channel very soon. Uh, Andy, Robert, Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it's 10 minutes past time already, so I'll let you go. But uh, I have been, I have a lot of notes and I have uh, gained so much knowledge and insights inside from you guys. Anna, again, thank you so much for the comments, for the provocations, for the, all the knowledge that you also shared with us. And Roman, thanks for helping me uh, or I help me helping you to organize this. Uh, and to, to bring also insights and provocations and, and also to invite Andy on. I'm a huge fan of Andy's writings and uh, research. Uh, and yeah, thank you so much. And I hope to see you again soon. Thanks very much. See you soon. Yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah, also, uh, I, I forgot to say thank you for everybody who joined us. <laughs> yeah, we didn't see you all, but now you're uh, switching on your cameras. Maybe just uh, a quick goodbye. And uh, yeah. Goodbye, everybody. Bye. 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 -bye.